Okay, so which of the following is a data item in a class? An instance variable, a method, or the public keyword? What do you call the data item? Well, I'll give you a big hint. What is a method? It's a function that's part of a class, so it's not a data item. Did I hear somebody say the answer? Is it instance variable? Yes, yeah, an instance variable is a data item, right? If your thing is a point that's got X, Y, and Z in it, then uh, it's got three instance variables, one for X, one for Y, and one for Z. What is the keyword that creates a new object? I shouldn't have used the word new because like whenever we create a scanner, what do we do? Yeah, yeah, it's new. So what is the word speed called? The thing that's inside the parentheses. Is that an, okay, some of these are really stupid. Cargo, passenger? I'm gonna go with A. I'm gonna go with A too, yeah. They could have come up with more realistic words to try to throw you off there. And what's the formal name for a method set age? That, what's the formal term for a setter? Uh, accessor. That's a getter. Oh, it's a yep. Oh. Getters are accessors because they're accessing. Setters are mutators because they're mutating it. They're changing it. All right, let's go look at chapter seven. I'm going to need to go repair and post the chapter 6 quiz. Not right now. Let's go look at chapter 7. More about objects. So object creation, a detailed analysis. Let's start the chapter with a behind the scenes detailed look at what happens when a program creates an object. This creates the reference variable. Now when we're talking, or at least when I'm talking, I tend to conflate, which means mix up, the terms object and reference. But that's like conflating, that's like mixing up your address with the actual house, right? So, you know, you don't live at apartment 20B. You really live at the apartment located at address 20B, if that makes sense. So the new keyword creates an object and stores a reference into it, into this variable. But I always just say, you know, the car is an object right you know this variable is an object but it's not it's really a reference to an object so here's where we declare our reference variable here's where we create the object itself allocates all the bytes you know in the memory for it and, and put writes all the information necessary and then it copies the address of that object into this reference variable and then when we do dot year naughty naughty they didn't use a setter they, uh, that's assigning a value to the instance variable. We know it's an instance variable because it's referring to an instance. It's referring to it by its variable. If it was a class, if it said capital C-A-R dot, that means it's a class variable. And if it was a class variable, you wouldn't even need the rest of this stuff because it's referring to a variable that's the class itself and not part of any particular instance. That's what the static keyword does. So space is allocated in memory for this. The reference variable is created, but it doesn't contain anything useful yet. And then this goes and allocates memory for a new object. And the address of that object is stored in there. And then this uses that address 
to find us this whatever specific bytes would let us hold that number in it. So sometimes people use the terms the stack and the heap. I would have to get on the board to draw the difference of them and our missing student wouldn't get to see it, but I think I'm going to go ahead and do so anyways. Or I could just use Excel. Yeah, let's use Excel to try to get it going. Let's write a little program in Notepad. We have a function called foo that has a variable in it, int x. And then we have a main that declares a variable called y. And then it calls foo. And then it creates a new scanner. Scanner s equals new scanner. And you really don't have to type all this because it's not a real program, right? And then it calls foo again for some dumb reason. So that's our program. And out here, we're going to say that this is the stack and this is the heap. Those are two different parts of memory. Every program that runs on your computer, you're going to let me stretch those out. Whenever your program runs, it gets two allocations of memory. It gets some for the stack and some for the heap. So our program starts at main. It allocates a little bit of memory here. Allocates four bytes for it because it's an int. You know, and if we stored some value in it, we could write that in there. But I'm just putting the name of the variable there. And then we call foo. So it runs up here, and it creates space for that variable. But then there's a return statement. It's kind of implied. But it returns out of that method. And when it hits that, that variable is, is gone. It removes it from the stack. So we no longer have that. I'm going to break this up into two statements, just like they did in the slide. This creates a reference variable, right? So now we have room for variable. And then this new thing goes out to the heap and allocates however many bytes it needs to hold a scanner. Let's say that, you know, it's from here to here or whatever, you know, it's, it could be a bunch of information. So anyways, here's our scanner. It's all these guys, right? It's done with that. And so S now points to the address of that block of memory. And then for some reason, we call foo again. And so it comes out here, foo creates its own variable. It leaves the method, so x gets erased. And then when it finally hits that brace, all the variables that were created between those two braces disappear. So that gets released, that gets released, and now we have what's known as an orphaned object. It's a block of memory allocated on the heap with nothing pointing to it. And that's what the garbage collector is for, whenever you hear the term garbage collector. It goes and it finds orphaned objects in memory and deletes them. And so since nothing is pointing towards it, the garbage collector sooner or later, and actually it's going to be sooner because the program's done, then goes and deletes it. So that's what this does, is it creates a space for a variable. That's what this does, is it goes and it allocates a byte large enough to hold a scanner. And then it stores the result of that into the S variable, whatever that memory address is, you know, 8,329, 8, 829, whatever. So the result of assigning one reference variable to another is that both reference variables then point to the same object. I think I've demonstrated that before. But if we come out here, And we have two variables that get created. I guess I could zoom this in, right? Like if we do this. Say we have two, two circles. Circle C1 equals new circle. And the circle class has a radius. C1.radius equals 10. 
and then we make another circle, circle C2. But instead of making a new circle, we just set it equal to C1. Okay, so as we were going, this variable creates space here. And then the new keyword comes out and creates, oh, what are you doing over there? Oh, I guess that was right. Get back over there. All right. Allocates memory out on the heap for a circle. So now there's a circle out there. And that circle has a radius of 10 after that happens. And this has got the memory address stored there. Let's just say that it's byte 4, right? Because, you know, it's on line 4. So C1 is equal to 4. 4 meaning which memory address points at that object. Now if we had this, C2 is equal to new circle, it would come out and allocate a new circle like that, right? And then C2 would point to that memory address, whatever that is. Looks like memory address 7, right? But it didn't. It didn't create a new circle. Instead, it set it equal to this one. Now that doesn't make a copy. It doesn't create a brand new circle to hold the information that was in the first one. Instead, it sets the new circle equal to C1. C2 is equal to C1. C1 was at memory address 4, so C2 now is memory address 4. We now have two addresses pointing to the same block of memory. That's just like two street signs pointing to the same street. Or two different maps pointing to the same city, right? Just because you have two street signs pointing to the same street doesn't mean you have two streets. Just because you have two city maps for Oklahoma City doesn't mean you have two copies of Oklahoma. I mean, doesn't mean there are two cities there. Just because there are two reference variables doesn't mean that there are two objects. These guys are both pointing to the same memory that this thing is. So if we printed out c1.radius, it would print 2, 10. If we printed out c2.radius, it would print 10. If we say c1.radius is equal to, and we change it to something else, c1.radius is equal to 20, it comes out here, C1 is located at memory address 4, pops over to memory address 4, finds the place where the radius is stored, changes it to 20. And then if we tell it to print C2 dot radius, well, C2 is also equal to 4. So it runs out to memory address 4, finds a radius, and it would print 20 as well. That makes sense? You just have two memory addresses pointing to the same thing. So with both reference variables pointing to the same object, if the object is updated by one of the reference variables, then the other reference variable will notice that change when it attempts to access the object. This can be disconcerting. Yeah, if you have multiple references to the same object, you have to kind of be careful because it could get changed on the sly. Like if you have an array of objects. You might think that you're creating a new object each time you add it to the array, but you might just be adding the same array Ob the same object to the array over and over and over. It's like adding the same house to the list. You might have a list that's 20 houses long, you thought, but they all have the same address. They all have 123 South Main on it. And so if you, let's, we'll come up with an example of that. I've already talked about an example, so I don't mind skipping through these slides. So what are they doing here? They wrote a method called make copy that creates a new car based on the old car. That's not a bad idea at all. This is about time when it'd actually be good to do a little bit of programming. Let's go ahead and launch, launch NetBeans. So I have a hunch that what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a the good old circle class that I use in a lot of demonstrations because it's so easy to comprehend. 
because a circle has one object, a radius. We could someday get a little bit more clever and decide that a circle not only has a radius, but an x and a y position. There's that beans. I kept waiting for it to come up, and it was sitting there in the background. New project, what lecture are we on? T. T is in T? All right. Okay, so I'm going to make a class, and I'm going to be a bad programmer and put it in the same file as main. Oh, wait. Apparently, when I created it, I didn't tell it to make a new file. That's a drag because I'm going to have to type it in by hand. New Java class. I swear I did this. Lecture T. Finish. Okay, so I have to put my class statement. There it is. I have to do public static void main. Public static void. Is main uppercase or lower? I believe it's lower. lower. String args. All right. Let's make sure it compiles. If I got that wrong, then all hope is lost. Build failed. I'm just going to recreate this. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. File, new project, Java, Java application. Do create my main class. Thank you very much. Lecture T2. Thank you. So what was wrong with my other one? I don't know. All right, so I want a circle class. I'm going to have one item in it, one instance member. Since I'm putting it in the same file as the other class, it can't be public. You can only have one public class, and it has to be the one that matches the file name. So class circle got a radius. Why did I type circle circle? What should that word be? It should just be class. Yeah. I'm going to make this a public variable to make things super easy to handle. Public int radius. And that's enough. So I'm going to go down in main and make a circle. Circle c1 equals new circle. We could make a constructor that would let us do that. Let's do that while we're at it. Let's add a parameterized constructor. So a constructor is a method that has the same name as a class and no return type. So public circle doesn't have a return type. And I want it to be able to accept an int that represents the radius. So int radius. And it sets this dot radius equal to the value that was passed in. However, when you create a parameterized constructor, it's a good idea to create the default constructor as well. Because once you add the parameterized constructor, Java stops giving you the default constructor. What's the default constructor? One with nothing between the parentheses. So public circle, parentheses, end parentheses, open curly brace, close curly brace. That's our default constructor. Doesn't need to do anything. That way we can create a circle either by passing a number in, and in which case it'll run that one, or not passing a number in, in which case it would run that one. But I want it to pass a number in. I want this thing to have a radius of 10. So as mentioned in that little lecture I gave on Excel, if we do circle C2 equals C1, and then we do C2 dot radius equals 30, and we print out C1 dot radius, what is it going to print? System dot out dot print ln C1 dot radius. What is it going to print? Remember what I said about two street signs pointing to the same street. C2 and C1 are both pointing to the same memory address. So when we change C2 radius to 30, what is C1 dot radius? It would be 10 if they were separate objects. 
but they're not. They are two, this was, start off as 10. When we set C1 dot radius equal to 10, it ran out to memory address four and it changed the radius to 10. But then we went and we said C2 dot radius is 30. So it went to C2, it found out that the object was at memory address four, it went here and it changed it to 30. And so what is C1 dot radius? Pardon? 30. 30, right, right, right. So when we run this, it should print out 30. Now what we may have wanted is for C2 to be a copy of C1. But it's not. But we could put a copy method in it. Right, like that. But we'd have to write that method. So why not? Let's go up to our circle class and add a method that creates a new circle. Meaning it's going to be of type circle. That's what its return type is going to be. So public capital C circle, not because it's a constructor, but because that's what this function is going to return. Its return type is circle. Its name is copy. So public space circle space copy parentheses. And what kind of parameters does it take? Do we have anything between the parentheses? No, so we don't need anything up here. And what's it going to do? It's going to create a new circle, set the radius, and then return it. So circle. We can call it anything else, anything we want. How about the word other? Or we could call it copy or whatever. Circle copy. I don't like the fact that it matches that, right? So I, I'm just going to call it circle C. Circle other equals new circle parentheses in parentheses. And then I'm going to set the other data equal to our data. Other dot radius equals this dot radius. and then return other. Now when we run it, c1.radius is going to still equal the original value. Why? Let's go back to our Excel spreadsheet. c1 Circle C1 equals new circle, creates a space out here, and then its radius got set to 10. The next line was C2 equals C1.copy. Well, what did C1.copy do? It created a new circle. So now we have a second circle out here at memory address 6. And that line of code did set its radius of the new one equal to the radius of the old one. So they both have a radius of 10 now, not a radius. And then it returned the memory address of that circle. If you remember this line here, return other. So the memory address of that circle got passed back, and it's at memory address 6. So C2 is equal to 6. All righty. Can I get these both up on the screen at the same time? Can I? Do that so I don't have to keep. All right. So now C2 dot radius is equal to 30. So which memory address am I going to change? Am I going to change that one or that one to set C2 dot radius? Am I going to use memory address 4 or 6? Yeah, because C2 is 6. So it jumps out here and changes the radius at memory address 6 to 30. Now when we print out c1.radius, what is it going to print? What's, what memory address is stored in c1? Right there. Four. So it comes out here and when it prints out that memory address, ex excuse me, the radius at that address, what is it? Ten. ten. Right. So it's going to print out ten, whereas it was printing out thirty before. All right, so 
This is a copy method. Sometimes people call it a clone method, right? I like the word clone, right? We have just cloned our object. I am losing my voice. We may have to stop talking. Stop class pretty soon, but then the C++ class is coming in. I better find some cough drops. All right, so I hope that makes sense. It's true in this language, in C++. It's true in Python. It's true in C Sharp. They all work the same way. If you create two different objects, but you actually only copy the reference rather than the object itself, then you, you get strange results. So using equal equal, this is a problem too. Because if I do this, I set both objects radius to 10. All right, let's create some new circles. Circle C3 equals new circle with a radius of 3. Circle C4 equals new circle with a radius of 3. And then if C3 equals equals C4, then I need a variable to hold this. I'm going to declare an int called x. So I can set it either equal to 1 or 2 based on these results. So if C3 equals C4, x equals 1 else x equals 2. Now no shame if you get it wrong, but somebody tell me whether they think x is going to equal 1 or 2 when this is done. That would be reasonable. It's not true though. The reason why, and we got to pull up Excel again, is it created a circle called C3. It allocated memory for it, so now we have a new circle at memory address 8. And then this created another circle, so we have a new reference variable there. The new command comes and creates another circle. Oh, I better leave room for that radius. When we created it, we specified that the radius was 3. Can't stand it, that's misspelled. And so the radius of that circle wound up being 3. Then this line of code here created a new circle and stored its memory address at 4. So yet another circle with a radius of 3. And what is his memory address? Just We're, we're pretending that the row number is a memory address. So what's the memory address of this circle? 10. 10. So OK, let's go and update. C4 is pointing to memory location 10. Now what does this line do if C3 equals equals C4? Is 8 equal to 10? No. So they are not the same. Even though they have the same contents, right? We might want them to say that they're the same. We might want to be able to compare two objects. Do you remember us saying in the past that you better not use equal equal to compare two strings? If you have string S1 and S2, you can't do this. What do we do? Do you remember how we compare two strings in this language? We use dot equals. If S1 dot equals S2, is that? Does that look familiar? Okay, okay. So we need to add a dot equals method to our class so that we could do this. If C3 dot equals C4. That's what we want to be able to do. So let's add a dot equals method to our class. So it needs to return true or false, so that means it's Boolean public boolean equals and what does it take as its object well what is in here what what type is that object excuse me variable that variable is what type we can tell just from here what is it declared as it is a c4 is a circle so circle space other 
I just like the word other for the for the reason you'll see right here. If this dot other is equal wait what what? If this dot radius is equal equal to other dot radius, I'm gonna change this up. This is my preferred way of writing it. And I'll tell you why in a minute. If this dot radius not equal to other dot radius, return false. And then down here, return true. Okay. So it checks. Are the radiuses different? If the radiuses are different, then return false. Otherwise, return true. Now, I could have written it where it said this dot radius equals equals other radius return true. But the reason I do it this way is because we might have more than one member. Right. We might have a patient class with a first name, a last name, an address, a zip code, you know, a patient height and weight and how many days they've been in the hospital and their birth date and whatever. We need to check each and every variable. Is this patient's name dot equals the other patient's name? Is this patient's, you know, ID number? That's probably actually would be enough, right, if you had two patients with the same ID number. But anyways, okay. Now to work. Now when it runs x will equal 1. Well, let's just put a system dot out dot print line parentheses c3 equals c4. And it's definitely going to print that. Else print c3 does not equal how come it's plural there and singular there? English is a weird language. All right, so don't compare objects using equal equal. So don't compare object references using equal equal. It'll almost never do what you're hoping it'll do. Instead, add a dot equals method to your class. So you can do this. So I'm going to run it. It better say that they're the same because they have the same radius. And that's our condition, right? If the radiuses are different, it returns false. Otherwise, it returns true. So when I click the green button, we see that they are the same. But if they are created with different radiuses, C3 equals new circle 3, but C4 equals new circle 4, now it's going to say that they're different. And so it's behaving correctly. What was the last class I had y'all write as homework? Fraction class, right? Okay. So your homework is going to be to modify your fraction class to have a clone method and a equals method. give you a big hint right here, right? The clone method doesn't take anything between the parentheses, whereas the equals method is going to take a fraction. And then modify main to show that these methods work.
So f1 should be a fraction you make. f2 should be a different fraction you make. f3 should be a clone of f2. Then use if dot equals to compare f1 and f2 to print whether they are the same or different. And they should be different. And use if dot equals to compare f2 and f3. And since f3 is a clone of f2, they ought to say that they're the same to print whether they are the same or different. That making sense? You already have an example of making a clone method. The only difference is you have two member instance variables because you have a nominator, a numerator, excuse me, and a denominator. So in your clone method, you're not only going to be setting one variable, you're going to be setting the other one as well. Other dot numerator equals this dot numerator, other dot denominator equals this dot denominator. And your equals method had better be comparing both variables. Right, if this dot denominator is not equal to other dot denominator return false, if this dot numerator not equal other dot numerator return false. So it may be a really short assignment, which is fine, as long as you have the concepts. All right, any questions over that?